That is so beautiful. I, I was telling Brother Joe in between service, uh, I said, you know, it seems like that, you know, so many people get New Jerusalem confused with heaven. Uh, but, you know, the, the streets that are made of gold, they're going to be in the New Jerusalem. Uh, the heaven, I don't know what all it's like. It's, the glories are beyond compare. But uh, to, to be in the New Jerusalem where the, the streets are going to be as transparent glass. Uh, you know, it's just the, and made of gold. It's just going to be a beautiful sight to behold. It'll be nothing like, nothing we've ever seen in this world. But I want to go back to the kind of, I don't know, I want to say backtrack this morning. We'll get to it here in just a second. But if you have your Bibles, Daniel chapter 2, I want to read 31 just to cover some things down through 36. It tells us in verse 31, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them in pieces. Then, when, then was the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away. The no place was found for them, and the stone that was smoked, the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. And if I could have your uh, attention this morning just to talk to you a little while about the stone from the mount. Talking about a couple of weeks ago, we looked at this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had and he couldn't, you know, the story. He, he had the, the dream and, and yet he couldn't re recall the dream. And, and they said, well, tell us the dream and, and we'll interpret it. Uh, nobody could do it. And Nebuchadnezzar was really ready to just destroy all his, his advisors, all of his court that he had around him, and his magicians, his astrologers, all his things that he had around him. He wanted to destroy them all. But, but Daniel said, oh, what, what, what's got the, the, the king in an uproar, if you will? He said, the, the God that I serve, he will give you the interpretation. And we know the story of how Daniel went back and he, he prayed with his friends and God gave him the dream and also gave him the interpretation of the dream. And, and as we talked about, if you remember, we talked about the fact that uh, they went through the meaning of that the gold was Babylon, representative of Babylon. The silver was the Medo-Persian era. The bronze was the Greece era. And the iron was Rome. And then we get down to the feet and it's a mixture of clay and iron. It's not a, each one is progressively not, not as strong as the one before. Each one of them comes down in a step of, of, of prestige and honor and glory, if you will. But the last one, the feet, is a future uh, 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 empire of the world. This is talking about world domination of empires. We haven't seen this empire yet, but it's coming. And, and if you don't think it's coming, just look at the world around us. Uh, if you don't think it's coming, this globalization, the new world order, it's coming. You know, when, when things have, have been done in America that make no sense whatsoever, they're against any common sense that anybody with half a brain would, would know. Uh, when you see these things happening, uh, things that are, are, are mind-boggling in one way, but in another way, if you look at it from a biblical perspective, we see that the spirit of Antichrist is working around the world to draw the world together so that one of these days uh, they will defend by God for the last time. But that, that this, this morning, the major thing I want to talk to you about is talk about that stone. I want to talk to you about that stone that was cut out of the mountain. It was cut out without hands. It was formed, in other words, by, by God. And if anything sets the tone this morning for this sermon, 
is a quote by David Jeremiah. He says, as he writes in this book, the devil seems to be writing history now, but he will be history in the near future. Amen. I love that this morning. It, it looks like he's writing everything that's going on. And we may be scratching our heads. We may be baffled at the things that are going on. But one of these soon days, uh, he's going to be history. He's going to be gone. He's going to be wasted. Amen. By the power of the living God, he's going to destroy old Satan. Uh, he's already defeated. Uh, but he's going to be destroyed one of these days. And I look at this this morning, we look at the first thing I want to talk to you about is the stone. Uh, David Jeremiah writes, you know, we can build a superstructures. We can build skyscrapers. But he says, we cannot build a stone. And you know, it's amazing. And as much as we use stone for, I, I think about uh, the things that... Uh, they're going always talking with James yesterday. You know, it seems like he said they can't keep up with 57 stone. If you know what, that's used a lot in, you know, parking lots, driveways, whatever. It's just used in concrete. It's just a popular size stone that they use. But it, it's, it's always used everywhere. We can, we can use them. We can break them down. We can bust them up. We can tear them up. We can put them in holes. We can put them on countertops. We can put them in floors. Whatever we want to do with a stone. But we can't make any more. Amen. We can't make any more. Because God's the only one that makes stone. Amen. I thought about sometimes here recently, I've thought about, you know, all the things, all the, the massive things that, 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 that the, this world has seen that men have made. And then you can go down to a place that, down here next to Lexington, a natural bridge, and you see that bridge that, that God made. Amen. <laughs> And it's been there, and it's been there for a long time. And I, I believe it's going to be there for a long time to come. But when God does something, he does it well, doesn't he? He does everything well uh, uh, this morning. But if we go back and look at the stone, it says in Exodus 17, 5 and 6, it said, And the Lord said unto Moses, To go before the people and take with the, with the of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take it in thy hand and go. He says, Behold, I will stand. Here, here's a key point in this, this morning. The Lord said, Behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come forth come water out of it, and the people that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders. And if you go to uh, Numbers, you find out that actually Moses lost his cool at this rock. Amen. Yeah. And he smote it twice. In anger because of the people that just made him mad. But God was wanting to show his people. He took the glory out of that. He said, must we fetch water out of this rock for you? But he took the glory from God and, and he took it to where he did it himself. And, and you look at this and God was wanting to show his people the glory of God. And to show them that he was the rock. He was that water. He was that living stone. And we find that even in Corinthians it backs us up. It tells us that uh, that rock was Christ. Uh, that rock was Christ. And we see that, that it was a representation of what was going to come. Jesus was the living water. Jesus was the one that was going to quench all thirst. Jesus was the one that was going to fill us up with the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, Jesus was the one that was going to cause us never to be lonely, never to be lost, uh, never to be suffering, wandering in the wilderness of this world. He was going to give us life. He was going to give us joy. And he was going to give us peace. And Jesus was that rock. He was that rock this morning. But we know that Jesus was that rock that came, that suffered. He was smitten. In Isaiah, we read it in chapter 53. It tells us that he was stricken, smitten of God. Just like that rock that Moses struck. Just like that rock that Moses hit. It was a representation of what uh, man would do. Man was going to strike out at Jesus. Uh, man was going to cause uh, 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 Jesus to be crucified. You 
know, we see the stripes. And, you know, could you imagine the stripes that, that was laid upon his back? They said that he could have died just from the stripes upon his back, the blood that was lost, the, the shredding of his back, the, the tears that was there. The, it was just an, uh, an ugly scene. Nonetheless, uh, the crown of thorns that was pierced upon his brow to where, you know, this is a tender spot if you ain't ever hit your head on anything. And, you know, I, I hit my head all the time. It's probably, you know, I don't know, just dumb luck, I reckon, <laughs> or dumb me. But sometimes God has saved me by wearing a hat a lot of times. And, uh, even while I was working on Katie's house, it seemed like I, I, I turned around and had a piece of metal hanging down that caught my hat instead of my head. But thankfully, if it hadn't have done that, I wouldn't, I would have, I done forgot about it with being there. But anyway, but this is a tender spot up here, you know. But Jesus took a crown of thorns and they pressed it into his head. And, and, and I don't know, it, it, it's, a, it, it's a relatable pain uh, uh, of something that maybe Brother Dave can talk about that fishing hook in his head to you sometime. <laughs> it, it ain't too good, amen. Praise the Lord. But Jesus was smitten. He took the nails in his hands and in his feet. He stayed on the cross to where he had to, they say he had to push up on his legs just to breathe. And could you imagine the excruciating pain that traveled up through his legs and through his knees and, and through his thighs just trying to get that push just so that he could get a gasp, a gasp of air down into his lungs. Could you imagine the, just pulling up and feeling the, the pain that, that stretched through his arms and, and went down through his, his shoulders and went down through his skeletal body just, just to try to catch a breath of air. And he died in our place. He took that for you and for me. He took that for a world that is lost and yet... When the Bible says, and Isaiah said, as we've, if we've esteemed him stricken, smitten of God. And many today, they don't think that Jesus died for their sins. They just, they'll still think that Jesus is a good man, or Jesus was a good teacher, or Jesus was a, was a prophet. And they still think sometimes that there's many ways to God. But I'm here to tell you this morning, Jesus made a way for us that nobody else can make. There's no other deity. There's no other little gods. There's no other path of redemption. There's no other way that you and I can be saved but through and by the blood of Jesus Christ. He is our only hope this morning. Yes. As we read Wednesday night, Jesus said in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. That's what Jesus is telling the world. If you need something, you're not going to find it in this world. You can look all over this world. You can look over it. You can look under it. You can look around it. You can look in the cities. You can look in the country. You can look in the desert. You can look in the, in, in the plains, wherever you may be, but I'm here to tell you you're not going to find what you're looking for inside your heart and inside your soul except for what Jesus gives you. You're not going to find that peace. You're not going to find that joy. You're not going to find that love. You're not going to find what you're looking for until you get Jesus. He's that living water. He's the one to come. He is that stone. This morning, as we look at this scripture, we go back to the book of Daniel there and what he said that, that Jesus was that stone that was cut out of the mountain. If you think about this, there's other ways. There's so many scriptures in there that talks about Jesus being the stone or Jesus being the rock. Jesus is the chief cornerstone of the church. He is the building of the church. He is the church. He's the head of the church, but he is the cornerstone. And we look at that this morning. We think about Jesus when he came. And, and I was talking to somebody. I was talking to a lot of people yesterday. But, you know, we think about Jesus and I'm not trying to knock what we do. You know, we all see the scenes of Christmas time. 
where we put the, the manger out there, the little wooden crate that we have, and we put the baby Jesus in the crate, you know? But actually, in reality, it was a, a, a trough that was made out of rock. And that's what they used back in the day. They would hew out the rock to where they could make a trough in it so the animals could, could feed out of it. Here Jesus was the rock. He was laid inside of a rock when he was born. Then we see that Jesus died on a rock. He was placed on a hill called Golgotha. It was placed on, it was called a, a place of a skull. It was a rocky place where he was killed. He was placed there to die for you you and me. But not only that, was he placed in an old cave? He was placed in a rock and a rock was rolled up over the tomb. But thank God on the third day, hallelujah, that stone was rolled away. Glory to God. And Jesus came out alive. Amen. And thank the Lord this morning, he's alive forevermore. Amen. This world looks at us like we're a bunch of plum, a bunch of hillbillies, crazy, uh, ignorant people but I'm here to this morning I pray that one day before it's too late they'll just be like we are and come on the hillbilly trail amen if they want to call us that because there's coming a day that God spoke about in his word as brother Kobe talked about this morning there's coming a day before that new Jerusalem comes down that God's going to put down every sin he's going to put down every dictator he's going to put down every robber or crook or king or queen or whatever it may be that stands up in defiance of, of God Almighty. We look this morning, Jesus is that stone. He was that stone. And he's coming again. There's coming a time when Jesus, when he comes, man, there, there's nothing going to be able to stand in his presence. You see, one of the things that we read there in that scripture, you think about this, when that stone strikes that clay and iron of the feet, why does it strike the last part and not the head? Because as I've read, this is these were actually kingdoms that have come, but there's one to come. Jesus is going to put down the last one yeah. and the final one. And we see, as Daniel says, when that stone strikes that feet, it's going to be like dust. It's going to look like the chaff. It says in the threshing floor, this is the dust that's going to disintegrate. The powers of Satan are going to be destroyed. The powers of Satan that entered this world and, and have corrupted this world. Oh, man, do we not have a world of corruption? Do we not have a nation of corruption and possibly a state of corruption? Do we not see it everywhere we see corruption? But the Lord is going gonna, is gonna to puff in a ball of dust, amen, just like that, and it'll be gone. All the powers, all the people that flex their muscles, all the people that yell and scream, all the people that say, I got the power, all the people that want to tell you and me what to do, amen, we're going to be under new leadership, amen. We're going to be under new rule and reign, as Brother Cody said. There's going, to be a, there's going to be a new charge, amen. There's going to be a new covering in this world one of these days. But here's the timing this morning. When's the timing of all of this going to be? And this is the part this morning I want us to get a hold of this morning. I want you to get a hold of this this morning. And I, I, I want God to get a hold of me this morning. Let me realize how close we are to the coming of the Lord. I, I, as, as brother or our brother or Dr. Jeremiah says, you know, we're not time givers. We don't know the exact time or the hour. The Bible tells us that no man knows the day or the hour when Jesus shall return. And it's, uh, we know that that is put into the Father's hands to tell Jesus this time. And when that happens, it's going to come, and it's going to come quickly. But the, the second coming of Christ, we know through the scriptures, is in two parts. First, it is, we've got to understand, first, in the rapture of the church. 
And he was talking about what I believe he called a millennial, millennialist. There's a society or there's a group of Christians that have kind of wandered a little way off the reservation here just a little bit. And we're not to hate on anybody. We're not to be mean to anybody. But I'm just saying they've got their theology messed up a little bit. They think that, that, that we are here as Christians, that the, the kingdom of God is already here. They think that, that, that Christ in us, we're to reach out and we're going to just keep building more Christians and more Christians and more Christians. And that's how the kingdom of God is going to arrive here on earth. But that's not the case. That's not scriptural. That's not, the, that's not good theology. If that was the case, uh, uh, why in the world this morning do we have blessed people in the house of God? Why in the world did God say that he's coming back and he's going to crush the, those iron feet of clay and mixture of iron? Why is he going to put a, a tribulation period upon this earth to judge the earth and the sins of this earth? Why is all that going to happen if the kingdom of God is going to envelop out of us Christians that are already here? And it also takes away the, the fact of the, the rapture of the church. But the timing, here's the timing that is going to happen. In 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, Daniel 9 and 24, and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make the end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. That's talking about Jesus, amen. When he comes into that, that new city, that new Jerusalem they're talking about, but he says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. And the street shall it be built again in the wall even in troublous times. After threescore and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined, and ye shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. For the overspreading of abominations he shall make, make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. This scripture here that we find in 9, 24 through 27 in the book of Daniel, we got to understand that one prophetic week, that, that the 70 weeks that they're talking about, this one prophetic week is equal to seven years. We good there? One week, seven years. One week, seven years. And we look and see, so 70 weeks was determined until the time that he was talking about when, when uh, what he begins to talk about to reveal the 70 weeks unto to Daniel. These 70 weeks are determined as a total of 490 actual years. But there's a separation in between them. We're going to look at that this morning. Daniel 9, 25, it talks about from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So from the issue of the king to return to rebuild the walls that was given to Nehemiah to go back to Jerusalem, to build the walls, to go back and restore the city, the restoration of the city, to including the temple, to complete the canon of the Old Testament that was written was seven weeks. Or 49, 49 years from the time that Daniel was given this. From that time to, the, to the, the next time was 49 years. But it says from the completion of the writing up until Jesus' last physical week on earth was 62 years. So from when Nehemiah, we see from the, when the commandment was given that Nehemiah could go back. Until Jesus' last week on earth, there was a total of, of, of everything together was 69 years. 62 plus 7. 69 years. That's the prophetic weeks that we saw. 
So this three score, then it tells us that after the three score in two weeks or the 62 weeks, it says the Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. What was that talking about? Jesus died for our sins it was after the 62 weeks. But all of a sudden we look at this, it says here, that's 62 weeks. But in to to total was 69 years or 483 years. But there's one week that's left that's missing. All this has happened. All this prophecy has been fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross for us. When Jesus went, came and, and died on the cross, all that prophecy was fulfilled. Sixty and nine weeks, but that leaves one week, one prophetic week. is seven years. That's the tribulation period. This was what, what God was revealing to Daniel, was letting him know that, hey, there's going to be a time period that's here that, that, that you know a lot of people don't understand and, and a lot of people don't uh, communicate with this very well. But this one week, it says, and he was a speaking of the Antichrist in Daniel 9, 27. He's going to con covenant with, the, with Israel for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice of the oblation to cease. In other words, in the middle of this, the scripture tells us and reminds us that Israel is going to come to the conclusion the Antichrist was not the Christ we were looking for after all. He was not the Messiah. And they're going to come to believe and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ in the middle of that week. But tribulation is going to be poured out in those seven years. That It's going to be great tribulation, none like we've ever seen before. This is, this is something for us to see, that we are living in the last days. We're waiting for that one week to be completed. Now, how come we're that much closer than we've ever been? Listen to this. We recognize also... That this period that we have between the time that Jesus left and the time that the tribulation starts is a time of the Gentiles. In Luke 21, it tells us this, And when we see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out of it. And let not them which are in the countries enter in thereunto. For these be the days of vengeance, and all that these things which are written may be fulfilled. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now there, there's many things, and maybe this has a twofold meaning. I, I don't know it all, but there's two things that we need to understand this morning. Part of this has already happened. Uh, these were the words of Jesus, and they were fulfilled. Starting in AD 66, the Jews of Judea, they rebelled against the Roman masters. In the response, the emperor Nero dispatched an army uh, uh, with a, a, the, under the generalship of uh, Vespasian, if I get that right, to restore order. In 68 AD, uh, Nero died and Vespasian took over and it left Titus to lead the Roman army. In the year 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed. It was wiped out. It was, it was, it was destroyed. It was compassed about with armies. It was destroyed. Israel was scattered among the nations. This was true. This has already happened. But also a prophecy of the Bible has been fulfilled that they came back in one day. David Jeremiah says, many scholars believe that those begin, that those times began to draw a close of when Israel became a nation in 1948. And Abram's physical descendants claimed Jerusalem as the capital of the Jewish state. How close are we to the coming of the Lord? If the time of the Gentiles is starting to end in 1948, 
if the Jewish nation has been revived, they've retained their heritage. They've retained their name. They've retained, they still can speak Hebrew language. They've, they, they've kept their language. They've kept their customs. They've got it all right there. They're even getting ready. Uh, they're wanting to build a temple unto God. Uh, they're making preparations for the coming of the king. And I don't know how far they've gotten. I don't know how far they're going to get. But I'm here to tell you this morning, uh, I believe with all my heart, we got to realize how close we are to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ by the timing of it all. If we realize that the 1948, the time of the Gentiles was coming to a close, uh, God is trying to get a people ready. God is trying. He's given grace uh, and more grace. Uh, he's given grace above grace uh, to those that would come to him and believe and follow him. But yet that window of opportunity is slipping away. That window is coming to a close. The time of the Jewish people is going to revert back to them in the, in the tribulation hour. It'll be no longer the time of the Gentiles. God's going to break it down. God's going to destroy it. God's going to break the back of those that come against Israel and come against the Jewish nation and his people. And he's going to reign one of these days. Salvation. Romans 15 and 12 tells us that Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of the Jesse, out of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and in him shall the Gentiles trust. Now, that's exactly what's going on. We're under a time of grace, but that grace, that hour of grace, may be getting closer to the coming of the end because Jesus is getting ready to come back. Amen. just reminded me of a song. I had the words to it here. I don't know if I can sing it or not. I don't know. Because I heard about a stone that was hewed out of the mountain. Lord, I heard about a stone that came rolling down from Babylon. I heard about a stone that was hewed out of the mountain, Lord, and tore down the kingdoms of this world. Oh, I'm searching for that stone that was hewed out of the mountain, Lord. I'm searching for that stone that came rolling down from Babylon. I'm searching for that stone that was hewed out of the mountain, Lord, and tore down the kingdoms of this world. Oh, Daniel saw that stone that was hewed out of the mountain, Lord. Oh, Daniel saw that stone that came rolling down from Babylon. Oh, Daniel saw that stone that was Hewed out of the mountain, Lord, and tore down the kingdoms of this world. Oh, my mother had that stone that was hewed out of the mountain, Lord. My mother had that stone that came rolling down from Babylon. My mother had that stone that was hewed out of the mountain, Lord, and tore down the kingdoms of this world. You know I found that stone that was hewed out of the mountain, Lord. You know I found that stone that came rolling down from Babylon. I found that stone that was hewed out of the mountain, Lord, and tore down the kingdoms of this world. Well, you can have that stone that was hewed out of the mountain, Lord. Well, you can have that stone that came rolling down from Babylon. Well, you can have that stone that was hewed out of the mountain, Lord, and tore down the kingdoms of this world. Oh, hallelujah. 
this morning. Jesus is going to tear down the kingdoms of this world. All those that prosper and, and look like they're doing just fine right now. One of these days they're going to come down and it's going to come down suddenly. It's going to come down just as quickly as they raise their head. God's going to put them down just as quickly and as swiftly as the dust is going to be like nothing we've ever seen before. And I, I believe we just got to keep looking up, children. We got to keep looking up. Jesus is getting ready to come back. Amen. Uh, the nuttier this world gets, we better keep holding on to Jesus, uh, getting closer. Uh, hold on to the nail scarred hand of Jesus. Yeah, man. Hallelujah. Amen. I just pray that God will put a hunger and a thirst in this world and in the in, in, our, in our church houses. We need the Lord this morning. 